Hello, and thank you for joining us today. For more than 20 years, Maximum Yield has been the go-to source of information on controlled environment gardening for growing professionals around the world. Today, we are proud to present Tricks of the Trade, operating a multi-tier cannabis grow, courtesy of PIP Horticulture, the industry leading provider of mobile vertical growing solutions. Be sure to put your questions into the Zoom Q&A console as we go, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Please note that a recording of the webinar will be sent to all registrants. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you today's presenters. As the Director of Cultivation, Michael Williamson uses his 14 years of commercial cannabis ownership and operational excellence to provide support and strategy for PIP's engineering sales teams along with client op operators. Michael co-founded Greenhouse Industries in 2013, now a division of PIP Horticulture, and is an early pioneer in vertical farming. Anders Peterson is a cannabis operations specialist at PIP and helps inter integrate mobile, mobile racks, mobile vertical racks, pardon, and VAS airflow systems into facility design. He is, an, he is a leader in indoor CEA facility design and operation with an academic background in cell and molecular biology and over 10 years of cannabis industry experience. With that, please take it away, Michael. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly, for having us. And thank you, Maximum Yield. And most importantly, thank you for everyone attending. Um, in this webinar, we're going to be talking about um, a couple. Uh, let's see. My slide just disappeared. There we go. All right. So on today's agenda, we're going to be talking about some new perspectives on how to operate your facility. We're going to talk about my favorite one, actionable insights that you can implement today as an operator, uh, KPIs and metrics to baseline performance operational strategies for each production phase, and tips and tricks to help you succeed. Right, so next slide. Um, we wanted to set the stage a little bit here and um, talk about um, some of the key differences between single-tiered HPS, as you see on the left in the image, and multi-tier uh, LED cultivation that you see on the right. So first and foremost, I want to take a moment to acknowledge all the various elements and components that need to be integrated harmoniously while starting and operating a new multi-tiered cultivation facilities. Cultivators have to dial in a new facility with new equipment, new technology, new genetics usually, uh, train a new team with new workflows, new SOPs, and then do all that with an overlay of seed to sale tracking and compliance. And needless to say, there are a lot of moving parts. And typically it'll never be perfect from the get-go, but if you invest in pre-planning for the win and focus on the KPIs that help you drive data-driven decisions, then you'll have a leg up on your competition. Cultivators going multi-tiered for the first time commercially should consider being supported by uh, an experienced team member or consultant with a proven track record in vertical farming. We see cultivators that take a collaborative approach with teammates and consultants who have divergent but complementary skill sets um, typically result in best-in-class operations. You know, during startup and commissioning, it's it can be a slightly chaotic or controlled chaotic time. Um, but startup and commissioning is an excellent opportunity for team building, building confidence, improving communication, sometimes weaning out the the weak. Um, and during those first couple of years of operations, it's critical. Uh, it's critically important to have light feet and be prepared to pivot as the market shifts. And remember, it's a marathon and not a sprint. One of the other things that I wanted to kind of address right away today was um, a common um, concern uh, from a single tiered HPS cultivator thinking about going multi tier. And those concerns are really about reaching quality and yield goals with multi tiered LED. So when it comes to quality, it can be a bit challenging to identify uh, a unit of measurement other than price per pound or gram or gram sold. Quality is subjective, and one of and what one cultivator or buyer might think is high quality, uh, another buyer or cultivator might think it's medium quality or even low quality. Um, from a wholesale and retail flower perspective, HPS grown versus LED grown cannabis does not have different price points uh, like indoor grown or greenhouse grown or outdoor does. The retail market has both HPS and LED grown flowers on the on connoisseur and top shelves. So when it comes to addressing yield concerns between single-tiered HPS and multi-tiered LEDs, it's a whole lot easier. So the best single-tier HPS cultivators that we work with and know of are somewhere between 90 and 120 grams per square foot consistently in terms of yield. 
So let's just assume that we have a 1500 square foot flowering room. And within that single, and it's a single tier. And within that 1500 square feet, we have 1000 square feet of flowering canopy. Well, at those grams per square foot that I mentioned earlier, this equates to roughly 200 to 260 pounds per harvest. So now let's look at that same size room, but with two tiers and multi-tiered LED. And so our typical LED cultivators are somewhere between 65 and 80 grams or more per square foot. Um, so it's slightly less, but that's per tier. And now we have two tiers. So when we look at combining those two tiers together, we have 130 to 160 plus grams per square foot. Assuming that same flower room of 1500 square feet, we've now managed to fit 2000 square feet of flowering canopy by going multi-tier. That's the whole point of going multi-tier. It's all about creating additional canopy in a space where that canopy couldn't exist on a single tier. And so when we look at those same numbers again, well now instead of uh, 200 to 260 pounds per harvest, like the single tiered HPS, we're now hitting 285 to 350 plus pounds per harvest. And it might not seem like a big difference, but it's a, it's a massive difference in terms of revenue. We even have three tiered LED cultivators getting 190 to 240 grams per square foot. So it ends up being about 530 pounds in that exact same room as a single tiered HPS cultivator who was peaking at 260 pounds. Um, you know, in summary, multi-tier outperforms single tier every single time when cultivator experience and skill set is apples to apples. Anders, I know that you've got a lot of cool tricks and tips for growing under LEDs for the first time. Can you share some of those with some of our listeners? Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you everyone for joining. Really appreciate you being here and listening to our presentation. Um, it's really interesting to me, and I always like to put it into perspective that the adoption of multi-tier cannabis cultivation and LED horticultural fixtures really share a kind of parallel path of adoption. They've both been in the market for about six years, give or take. Um, and so when a lot of growers are transitioning to multi-tier, it's often their first time growing under LEDs as well. And if you're used to HPS, you know, climate and root zone strategies, uh, it's not very easy to take those same strategies and just apply them to LEDs. You need to change all of your growth parameters slightly to account for a different lighting spectrum, which is the main driver in these rooms and lighting type. So essentially with LEDs, um, you can push your plants a little bit harder with all of your different growth parameters. Things like bumping your EC by about 10, 15%, lowering your runoff volume slightly, um, and then you can also raise your room temperatures with LEDs to achieve the same leaf surface temperature and VPD. Uh, in fact, I actually bump my VPD about 0.1 to 0.2 KPAs under LEDs compared to HPS. Um, and I found those type of examples to be really useful transitioning to LEDs for the first time. But regardless if it's your first time growing under LEDs, the greatest limiting factor to quality and yield that we typically see within um, multi-tier is the room design itself, specifically around the mechanical system or HVAC design, and then poor airflow. But after six years and thousands of these rooms being built, we've learned a lot, and the designs are significantly better than they used to be. And as such, the quality and yields are going up accordingly. So, but to learn more about successful room design, I highly recommend you check out uh, the last webinar Michael and I did on the design of multi-tier cannabis grow rooms. And you can find that on our website. Now, over the years at PIP, we have found we get a lot of the same questions from growers who are considering the switch to multi-tier for the first time. And I wanted to touch on some of the most common ones we get. Um, first and foremost, we usually get questions around, how do I access the plants on the upper tiers efficiently and safely? Growers weren't too keen on bouncing on ladders or constantly moving scaffolding around. And this is why the team at PIP developed the Elevate platform system to make it easy, safe, and efficient working on the upper tiers. You know, this system allows you to, to quickly set up a modular system at whatever working height is right for the job. One person can do it. Uh, and it just makes it a lot easier to work on the plants on the upper tiers, access them quickly. Um, and you can see pictures of this Elevate system throughout our presentation. The second thing we typically hear is a concern about plants growing too tall and stretching into the lighting fixtures in a multi-tier room. Timing is everything in a production setting. Um, 
And once you get the timing and rotations down with multi-tier, this concern quickly goes away. And we'll discuss controlling the stretch quite a bit throughout this presentation as well. And the last most common thing we hear is about which genetics you can grow in a multi-tier room. And the short answer is any genetics you can grow in a single level grow can be grown in multi-tier. Uh, in fact, you really get to know the characteristics of each cultivar in a multi-tier setting a little bit better. And if anything, this makes you a, a stronger cultivator in the end. Um, one of our good friends and colleagues here at PIP, uh, James Cunningham, he's uh, the owner of Fog City Farms in Santa Cruz, California, and the co-founder of Vertical Air Solutions. Uh, he's one of the first multi-tier growers in the country, and he talks about the genetics he can grow all the time. Michael, like, what, what does he usually say about his uh, cultivars he runs? Yeah. Um, when James first got started, he was looking for cultivars with minimal stretch and things that would fit the system was kind of the rationale at the time, which is common for a lot of cultivators. But um, fast forward, uh, you know, just a couple of years later, and I asked James the same question. I go, I noticed you're growing some OG Kush over here. I'm like, what can you grow in your system? And his response was, I can grow anything now. And it's really like you highlighted, it's really a matter of timing your veg and really knowing your plants. And so, as you mentioned earlier, all types of cultivars can be grown in a multi-tiered environment. It's just a matter of dialing them in. And you do that typically in the vegetative setting with your timing um, and in your flip timing. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, this one's a uh, visually um, kind of kind of pretty, um, but there's kind of a lot here. So Anders, would you mind kind of uh, giving an overview of what, what, what we're looking at here? Sure, I love this. I love data and numbers in cultivation. Um, Key performance indicators and KPIs and metrics are really how we gauge performance and improve our operation run to run. Um, I'm a huge proponent of data-driven cultivation. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of the equation and allows me to make quicker, more decisive decisions on uh, what's occurring in my garden. There are literally hundreds of KPIs and cultivation metrics that you can track, but we wanted to briefly touch on kind of the top three most important ones, uh, yield, turns or harvests per room per year and labor metrics, as these typically have the greatest impact on your business. Um, yield was historically talked about in terms of pounds of sellable product per light, but this is when almost all growers have the same thousand watt HPS lights with a similar layout. With all the variability in room design and lighting layouts today, this metric doesn't really hold up. Um, instead, a more universal metric, and which is now more preferred, is to discuss yield in grams of sellable product per square foot of canopy or grams per square feet. Um, for reference, we made this table here on the left, um, just showing a conversion of pounds per light to grams per square foot based on a four foot by four foot lighting coverage. And a good target to shoot for is around 80 grams per square foot or more, right? That's kind of a goal that a lot of growers are shooting for. And that's basically about three pounds of light or over uh, in the old metrics. We also put together this sensitivity matrix on the right-hand side of the screen to highlight how impactful these KPIs can be to your bottom line. We based these numbers on a facility with a total of 10,000 square feet of flowering canopy and a conservative $1,000 price per pound. And you can see those in the yellow boxes at the top. We chose $1,000 a pound just because I'm here in California where prices have dropped. But if you're on the East Coast, this number could be double or triple, just further impacting your business. Uh, the top section of the sensitivity matrix here shows the difference between 40 grams per square foot all the way up to 80 grams per square foot with five cycles or harvests per room per year. And then the associated annual revenue. Unfortunately, we see a lot of people getting stuck in the 40 to 60 grams per square foot range, but the ones who are really dialed in and have good room designs are easily hitting 80 grams per square foot consistently every single run. Uh, the common denominator we see with people down in the 40 grams per square foot range is the need for a better, better mechanical system design, better HVAC and dehumidification, and then more airflow throughout the room. And when those things are solved, the yields go up very quickly. Um, increasing your yields per harvest is always top priority, but you know huge impacts to your profitability can be gained with more turns per year. Uh, Michael, can you walk us through the bottom section of this table here? 
Yeah, um, I think everybody gets the whole grams per square foot. It's the obvious one, but I think it's turns per year or harvest per year that catches people by surprise if they're not thinking that way. And so as a best practice, we encourage cultivators to have minimal downtime in between harvests, ideally a next day room reset. Um, we define a next day room reset as harvesting all of the plants in one day or shift in that flowering room or zone cleaning and sanitizing that room, ideally same day or the very first thing you do the next morning. You could even have an evening shift in between if that's an option. Um, and then you're resetting and repopulating that flower room the very next day. Um, so if we look at a next day room reset, and that's going to be in your bottom right hand corner. Oh, here we go. We got our little highlight. Can you see nice. that? Yeah. I think yeah. You can very see nice. It. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so a next day room reset when you have nine week flowering cultivars, which is pretty typical these days, um, is 5.8 harvest per year. Um, and if we look at that, let's say on this 10,000 square feet of flowering canopy at a thousand dollars per pound, well, that's $6.3 million. You see that in the very bottom right hand corner. Now, when I talk to operators around the country, it's not uncommon for them to say something like, oh, we have about a one week turnaround time in between our rooms. Maybe it's five days. But each day that you're not flowering has a significant ramification in potential revenue loss. And so if we look at the next column over, you end up with 5.2 harvest per year when you have a one week uh, downtime or turnaround time on flipping a room. And so that becomes $5.7 million. So that's $600,000 plus dollars. And like Anders highlighted, if you're on the East Coast, that could be 1.2 or $1.8 million a year that you're missing out on because you can't turn your rooms over in time. And sometimes people like to make excuses for things like, oh, we can't do that because we don't have enough labor. Well, when you look at 600 to $1.8 million in potential revenue loss opportunity, I'm pretty confident that you can afford to hire a couple more people to make sure that you're flipping your rooms around in 24 hours. Um, and then it, to push it up even a little bit further, this is one of the reasons why we don't see a lot of people growing 10 week cultiva cultivars. Um, and another reason that it's usually not advised to what's called veg in place, um, which is where you'll actually veg in the flower room for a period of time, because all this eats on your harvest and turns per year. Now, in summary, every day not flowering in a flowering room has a significant cost in terms of loss of revenue opportunity, and you should calculate what yours is. And maybe you'll take a look at how you're doing things a little bit differently after looking at the numbers. Yeah. So the other major lever that we discuss, right? The first one's uh, yield. And the second one is harvest per year. And the last one is labor. Labor is a sneaky one. Um, labor is hands down an operator's largest expense and can also be the most difficult to manage. Uh, labor contributes to roughly 30 to 40% of cost of production. And I think Anders, you did some work with someone and labor was 60% of their cost of production. Yeah. They didn't even know the numbers until we ran them. And it was, yeah, it was over half of their cost of goods sold was labor. And that's, that brings me to my next point. Know your numbers. Um, I'm sure most of you probably watch Shark Tank. Think about Shark Tank. When you go on Shark Tank, if you don't know your numbers, they're going to eat you alive. So mm -hmm. the same is true in, in any operation. Um, know all of these tracking your critical KPIs, know them inside and out. And sadly, as Anders highlighted, most operators really have no idea what their true COGS or cost of goods sold per pound is. You'll hear them say something like, oh, it's $600 or it's $800. And what I can tell you as an operator, it's never a round number like that. If I ask someone what their COGS are and they say, well, it depends on the strain and you know, sometimes it's between... 385 and sometimes it can be as high as 440. Well, I know that they've been digging in their numbers. When someone gives me a round number like, oh, it's $500, I know that it's probably nowhere near $500. So there's been some shifts in kind of how we look at tracking labor from a KPI standpoint. Historically, we used to say, how many growers per light, light do you have? And back in the day, it was like one grower per 50 lights was pretty common. Mm -hmm. um, so now we don't talk about it per light. We have some of the reasons that Anders had highlighted about yield earlier. We look at it in terms of employees per square feet of flowering canopy. So a common industry practice, I'm not going to say it's a best practice, I'm just going to say it's a common industry practice, is one cultivation employee per 800 to 1,200 square feet of flowering canopy. So, you know, high labor would be, you know, one cultivation employee per 799 square feet of canopy or less, you know, the less you go, the, the more heavy you are in labor. And then on the opposite of the spectrum, lean labor looks at one cultivation employee per 1,200 plus square feet of flowering. 
So, you know, there's a lot of correlations between how people and plants interact. And there's even a lot of correlations with just between people and plants. Um, Anders, you got a really interesting data point um, that highlights the importance and relevance and speed of a cannabis life cycle compared to human life cycle. Can you share some of those metrics for the team here? Sure. I, I love comparing people versus plants just to kind of put things in perspective. But um, I mean, we may sound like we're getting to the nitty gritty here, but considering how short lived the cannabis life cycle is indoors, these KPIs and metrics become invaluable. You know, each day in a cannabis plant's life indoors is more than 1% of its total lifespan. So every single hour of every day has an impact. Compare that to a human's, you know, average lifespan, where every day in our lives is less than four one thousandths of a percent of our lifespan. So th this just kind of lends back to treating indoor cannabis like a finely tuned race car and kind of to the importance of tracking these numbers and making every day count. So shifting gears a bit, um, we're now going to talk about some specific strategies and best practices for each stage of the plant's life cycle, starting with mother plants or what's called stock plant production. Uh, Michael, why don't you take it away here on this one? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the pictures you're, you're looking at quickly here. So the one on the left is a traditional single tier large, older mothers. Mm -hmm. You can see they've been skirted up. There's been a lot of labor touches into a plant like that. You can also see it's a little bit messy. And if you do want to take cuttings, even though you're single tier, guess what? You're getting on a ladder to get up there to go take some cuttings. And they look uh, really old and woody here. If you look at these stocks, they're probably an old plant. And to stick with that general theme, uh, plants and people are not all that different. Um, as an example, the older someone gets, the more susceptible they are to health issues, stress, trauma events. Well, guess what? The same is true for plants. The older they get, the more susceptible they can be to disease, pests, stress, vigor loss. And technically, each cutting event is some form of stress. Um, anytime the environmentals fall out of an optimal VPD, that's a form of stress. So one of the biggest shifts that we've seen in mother production is moving away from older and sometimes exhausted um, single-tiered mothers, uh, larger plants, and moving to multi-tier uh, mother structure. So instead of growing really large plants, you'll be growing small to medium-sized plants, and you'll stagger that production. So typically, we're trying to cull or remove or destroy a mother typically around three to four months. And during that three to four month life cycle, you may take anywhere from three to five cutting events off of that plant before it gets exhausted. And let's say you have a three month mother, you'll also have a batch of it that's at two months, that's a little bit smaller, and you'll have a batch of it that's at one month. And basically, you know, every few weeks, you're cycling out the old moms and you're bringing in new moms and you're keeping uh, really steady production. And one of the big benefits that we see is it's just simply easier to maintain. And from my experience, you get, not only do you get more cuttings, but you get more uniform cuttings because as you look at the picture on the left, well, sure, the light is on top of the plant, but they're probably going to take cuttings from the side of the plant. They might take um, cuttings from the inside of the canopy. And all those kind of have a little bit of a different metabolism and, and kind of strength towards lighting. And so when you kind of have a, a clean hedge, you're able to get all those tops and they're all very, very uniform. Um, now, another thing I wanna talk about real quick is people talk about production schedules really for their flower rooms, but I don't hear enough people talking about production schedules for their moms. The plants that you put and choose as your mom shouldn't be the aftermath of what's left over from a veg batch uh, moving into flower. It should be the healthiest possible plants that you can, because that is a foundation for the future of all those future batches. So I really encourage people to not only have a flower production schedule, but also have a mother production schedule. Um, one of the other common, um, and it's not as common, but it's gaining popularity is what we call a, a clone to kill model or a cut to kill model. And the advantages of a clone to kill model are you're basically only taking cuttings off the plant once and then you destroy that mother. So it leaves, it gives you some of the healthiest clones that you can get. There's no doubt about that. Now, the downside of it is it takes up a lot of valuable real estate. You have to create a lot more square footage to just use moms once. And that's where it usually, the, the rubber doesn't quite hit the road for most operations. Now, the benefit of the multi-tiered environment is you can most likely shrink your mother room and actually have more mother production. And that when you shrink your mother room, you're now freeing up critical floor space for other parts of your operation. 
Um, Anders, can you um, highlight a, a, just a few mom strategies that are and some typical plant spacings that are common that we see in in, in mother production? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm also definitely a fan of the smaller, shorter lived mother strategy. It just helps me get more consistent, healthy top cuttings with more vigor. Um, it's best practice typically to vary your pot size and plant spacing based on the number of cuts you need for a certain cultivar and then tracking how many cuts you're getting off a certain sized and aged mom. Um, we're typically seeing pot sizes vary from half a gallon to three gallons per plant and plant spacing in a mother room ranging from 0.1 to half a plant per square foot. So that equates to about four to 16 mothers per four by eight tray based on your strategy. Um, and on average, plan for about two to three weeks of vegetative growth between cloning a mother, uh, just to let the plant reset itself and basically overcome the stress of the last cloning event, plus to have enough healthy cuttings to take. Um, personally, I, I really like running my moms in a four by four by four rock wool block stacked on a uni slab, which you can see actually in this picture here, similar method like that. Um, or onto a one or two gallon cocoa pot. And uh, mother rooms don't generate revenue though. So this space is very valuable. And for those who don't have an ability to bank genetics in a tissue culture uh, lab, but want to store a lot of genetics, uh, I like a, this kind of newer bonsai mom type strategy um, that I've been working with. So basically for cultivi cultivars that aren't in production, you can keep moms in a really small pot size, like just a four by four or three by three cube. Uh, I like to put them on the top tier with a shorter elevation and run a really low PPFD just to slow down their growth. And then you can continually cut them back to keep these plants really small with the goal being keeping them healthy and alive, but keeping them as small as possible so that you can store as many genetics and cultivars in your mother room as possible without, you don't, you don't need a full three foot mom if you're not running it into production with cutting. So um, then when you need to rotate that genetic back in, you clone one of these smaller mother plants, grow it out to a full production mother, and there you go. So it's a it's a nice strategy too to save space and store a lot more genetics. It would be ideal for someone who doesn't have access to tissue culture. This would be an alternative. Exactly. Yeah. All right, let's move on to some uh, bedroom management strategies. So the vegetative phase really sets the pace for your production cycle. You know, it determines how your plants will perform in flower uh, and is really key for uniformity and consistency batch to batch. Uh, veg strategies and lengths vary for every facility based on things like pot size, plant counts, targeted finished plant height, or your tier heights. Uh, it's really important to track in this in the bedroom your growth rates per cultivar as part of your crop registration program, and then grouping cultivars into harvest batches based on plant vigor and maturation times. If you are growing a lot of new genetics, I recommend measuring the internodal length every few days to track the growth rate and then begin grouping these similar cultivars. And I, I tie little tags around the nodes that I'm tracking and measuring uh, just to make it easy to identify. Um, depending on how much each cultivar tends to stretch and the height of your grow tiers and flower, you can then vary your veg time from, you know, as little as three days up to two or three weeks to get your desired finished plant height. Um, the more dialed in your climate and root zone parameters are in your bedroom, the faster your plants will root and grow more shoots, ultimately reducing your total veg time allowing you to get more turns per year out of your facility. So a lot of efficiencies can be gained in the bedroom with a good climate root zone strategy and healthy, robust, vigorous growth. In fact, I've seen facilities shorten their veg times from three weeks to 10 days just by dialing in their VPD and dryback strategies. So once again, this is where the importance of a, a good room design that allows you to achieve these parameters comes in. Um, I also wanted to touch on a you know, slightly controversial, but hot topic in the grow world of topping versus not topping your plants. Uh, in, in my opinion, there's no right answer to topping or not topping your plants. It's just another tool in the tool belt if you need it. At the end of the day, my goal is to fill out the canopy and flower enough so I get one to two apical buds or tops 
in every six inch square of trellis and flower while not letting the plants grow into the lights. And if you can achieve that one to two tops per trellis square uh, without topping, great. But for stretchier phenos, lower plant densities or shorter tier heights, topping is probably gonna be your only option. Um, topping in veg typically and not in flower, but setting it up for success there. And if you don't need to top your plants, I much prefer to just pinch taller branches to allow the rest of the canopy to catch up. As I found this method produces more rigid stocks and produces less smaller side branching that can become a, a sink for plant resources. So if I don't need to top a plant, I'm not going to. But um, you know, for certain situations, it's definitely a useful tool. You know, all canopy management or plant training techniques have a cost in terms of plant stress which can add up if you're not careful and delay your plant um, process flow. So Michael, what are your thoughts on plant training and stress? You know, it's a pretty interesting topic. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I sit in the same camp as you on topping and I just have a little thing I like to tell people, if you've never not topped your plants and you've just been topping this whole time, go ahead and run a little trial of with not topping and just see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. I historically do see that yields go up and I've noticed that um, my B buds are a little bit stronger because um, you kind of have a Christmas tree shape and you're getting more light down into the canopy versus kind of that wine glass canopy. So if you've never not topped your plants, I highly encourage you to run a small trial and just see what your plants do. It, it might not be right for all cultivars, but it does work out well for a bunch while reducing labor on your side so you can free yourself up to do other, other things. So coming back to what I call compounding stress events. Beneficial stress and non-beneficial stress is a very fine line in cannabis. Um, and, you know, the most advanced cultivators are riding that line for a different trade expression um, very, very tightly. And so when I say compounding stress events, I'm talking about multiple stress events all at once. And so I'll give you some examples. It's not uncommon to go to a facility and observe uh, during a transition from, let's say, maybe veg to flower that they will uh, operationally, they'll transplant into a new substrate. They may skirt or trim up the bottoms of the plant. They may top the plant. Uh, they may adjust growth parameters like lighting, uh, intensity, type of lighting. The environment could be different. A lot of times we see a lot of issues with relative humidity as they transition from veg to flower. Um, they may even do an IPM spray, uh, spray or drench, and they'll do all this at the same time. So these are all various forms of stress. And so if you, if it is your plan to do these things, you may want to consider spacing out the timing of some of these so that you don't have basically what, what I refer to as a stunted plant or a plant that loses vigor for sometimes up to a week. And that now cultivators can stop saying, oh, but it bounces back in, in flower or it bounces back a week later. We want to avoid kind of, um, manipulating the plant to the point where it kind of goes into a recessive uh, recovery mode and isn't in that active path of heterosis or hybrid vigor. That's what um, I call, that's what I call crop crashing and not crop steering. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, while we're on the bedroom, a really important area that I like to focus on, and it's an, it's an important KPI that I track the KPI or key performance indicator is my shrink rate or my cull rate. And so essentially what I'm doing is at various stages, propagation, various transplants and veg, I'm creating what I call quality control stage gates. And the purpose of a quality control stage gate is simply to put the healthiest possible flower, uh, plants into that next stage and cull anything that's weak or compromised. I refer to a weak plant or a compromised plant as a runt, not to be confused with the strain runts with a Z on the end. Um, and so as an example, let's just say I, I was in my flower room capacity, I had a capacity for 100 plants to fill the entire room. Well, in my veg, I would have 110 plants that I'm growing and I would put the, the out of the 110, I'm putting the 100 healthiest plants possible. Now, the goal with the cull rate or shrink rate, and typically when I start a new operation, the shrink rate or cull rate will be at a higher level. And then as we dial things in, I'm reducing the shrink rate. And I tell the growers, I go, your goal is to get to the point where you're throwing away healthy plants that would have thrived in flower. Once we reach that goal, we then start to trim our shrink rate down because shrink is a form of waste. Um, so maybe you start at a 10% shrink rate, but then you go down to a uh, a 7% and then a 5% and like real lean operations, they're usually running like a one to 3% shrink rate once they're really dialed in. 
So anything I can do to um, reduce unnecessary waste is, is a big win in my book. Um, all right, so let's let's transition over to the flower rooms. This is kind of a, where the money is made. Yeah. But I will yep. say flower to me is the easy part. It's kind of like that golfing expression, uh, drive for show and putt for dough. Uh, you know, your mother health, <laughs> your clone and your veg health set the stage for flower. If you're weak in those areas or compromised, you're not going to shine extra bright in flower. Um, so really focusing on your mother health will set the tone and stage for what's to come. All right, Mr. Yeah. Anders, you want to take this one away? Sure. Um, when it comes to operating a multi-tier flower room, transitioning the plants to flower and timing the stretch is kind of everything. Um, before moving plants from the bedroom into the flower room, it's best to preset the flower room's climate to VPD match the VPD conditions in your bedroom, just to limit the stress. It's a very stressful day for a plant to be physically moved from one room to another. So whatever you can do to limit that stress will prevent the plant from stalling out and basically prolonging its maturation time. And uh, so, you know, VPD matching in your flower room means you may need some humidification in flower since there's no plants transpiring to bring the humidity up. But this simple step is, is really beneficial. Um, and if possible, like we mentioned earlier, I would avoid vegging in place within a flower room as it limits how many harvests per year you can pull down and is tough on an HVAC system that's designed for a full flowering canopy to achieve those um, kind of set points. Um, so once plants are transitioned into flower, you can expect rapid, vigorous growth over the first two to three weeks with plants tripling or quadrupling in size. This is commonly referred to as the stretch phase of flower. Um, you know, I was, it was crazy. I was in a flower room last week that stretched three and a half feet in only 10 days after a three day veg length. And that was, it was, it's just mind blowing to see how quickly these plants can grow. And if you're not careful, you can run into a situation with stretch, uh, like this picture on the left-hand side of plants growing into the light, which can obviously restrict airflow, cause photo oxidation, uh, and just overall limit your yields. Um, so, you know, it's, and this is somewhat common for growers new to multi-tier to see these plants over vegged and stretching through the lights for their first few harvests. But it's not, it's not a big deal. You know, they, it gets better with every harvest batch. Um, the goal is to have the plants finish about 6 to 12 inches away from the lights at harvest, depending on your fixtures. Um, so to help this and kind of mitigate this stretch, it's best to start pinching the taller nodes and weaving branches through the canopy, the trellis, right after transplant to get everything uniform in height. Then continue pinching, bending, and trellising throughout the stretch. Um, you know, sending vegetative crop steering signals during this phase and providing adequate light levels will also help keep things shorter. Um, I found good success by reducing your photo period, actually, in the first week or so to a 10 to 14 schedule. So 10 hours of lights on, 14 off, or an 11, 13 uh, photo period schedule. Uh, this will really help reduce the stretch. Just make sure to maintain the same DLI with a shorter photo period as you would with a 12 hour photo period. And then after the stretch phase is over, go back to a 12-12 for the rest of the flowering cycle. Now in, a, in an emergency scenario, um, slightly lower room temps will also help limit the stretch and high, higher lighting levels. But this isn't something you should do every run as it can reduce your yields. Um, you know, your, your defoliation strategy is also an important step in this process and should be done throughout flower. Uh, defoliation, the physical plucking or removing of leaves from the canopy to thin it out, will help with humidity and airflow issues, along with reducing the number of leaves that have become sinks uh, for valuable plant resources. They're taking resources and not really contributing much to the plant's growth. Uh, defoliation timing and the amount you defoliate vary greatly on cultivar, um, but typically it's best to do a healthy defoliation event right at the end of stretch and after the bulking phase of flower. Um, our friend Dr. Allison Justice actually did a really interesting research project on defoliation and found that leaves receiving less than 200 ppfd of light do not photosynthesize effectively, but still transpire and are therefore sinks not a source. So those leaves can be removed. And that's just kind of a general rule of thumb. 
So, but defoliation can be quite a drain on labor resources if you're not careful uh, adding to your cost of production. And Michael has a really cool, you want to talk about your um, screen tech that you've worked on? Because I really like that sure. management technique. Yeah, Pretty you know, deep. the screen tech, before I describe it, I would refer to it as a Band-Aid. Um, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't refer to it as um, a long-term solution. But if you're a new cultivator, which a lot of you probably listening are, and you're working with new genetics that you don't completely understand, the screen basically works a lot. If you look at the picture in the right-hand corner, you know, it works a lot like a trellis. And so at some point, let's call it day five, maybe day seven, what you're doing with this screen, it's a 30% shade cloth. You're basically treating it like a trellis, but you're setting it six inches below where you want your plants to finish and flower. And so as Anders highlighted, if you're going to be six or 12 inches off, let's just say 12 inches off the light, and you want your top of your buds to be 12 inches off the light, you're going to set your screen at 18 inches below the light. So six inches below where it'll be. And what's basically happening, it's a temporary uh, shade cloth that goes on typically day five to maybe day 20. You kind of have to watch it as a grower. And what you're looking for, this is what ends up happening. I'm going to use my hand. You know, your apical meristem grows up and then it touches the screen. It's still getting plenty of light. And remember, we've got LEDs. So I put a 30% shade cloth on there, no big deal. I'm gonna crank up my LED. It's already dimmed down typically at this stage anyways to make up for that micromole level. I'm not asking, I'm not telling you to reduce your light by any means. Um, but so the screen will actually touch the apical mare stem. And this is based off of um, the science of uh, fig morphogenesis, if anyone's familiar with that. <laughs> it's commonly used in basil. Um, it's why the Bristol pines up at altitude grow a certain direction. Uh, thick morphogenesis is an external factor like wind or animal migration that manipulates how a plant grows. And so we're now manipulating by putting a little bit of pressure just on the top of that apical meristem. And now what's happening is all the hormones and all the en plant energy is redistributing to secondary and tertiary shoots, which are now catching up. And so as they all catch up, you'll start to notice the screen will start to get puffy and start to lift. When you start to see that lift, that's usually when we pull off the screen, we may dial down the, uh, the uh, LED concentration, but what you end up with is a laser level canopy. And, and for new growers and new genetics, this is a really great way to prevent um, unknown cultivars uh, from growing through your lights. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a really economical trick that you can use. Like I said, I consider it more of a band-aid while you're dialing in your genetics and not a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and beyond physical like labor tasks to manage the stretch, there's also a lot of environmental crop steering and root zone crop steering techniques that you can do, which is it, to get the same effect of minimizing stretch, but at a lower labor cost. And so environmental crop steering is essentially altering the climate in your room, adding or removing purposeful stress for a, a desired plant response. And so one of these techniques to minimize stretch is utilizing a technique called DIF, a D-I-F, or the difference between uh, the night temperature and the day temperatures. And a positive DIF would mean higher day temps than night temps, and a negative DIF would be lower day temperatures than night temperatures. And so there's a technique actually developed from the floriculture industry, I believe actually by a guy from Michigan State, um, where he calls it a cool morning pulse or what's called a morning temperature dip. And so what you're doing is you're running essentially a positive diff, lowering the temperature uh, a few degrees below the nighttime temperatures for the first few hours of the photo period because those first few hours of the photo period is actually where most of the stretch occurs. And so by running a cool morning temperature um, in the first few hours, you can eliminate a lot of that stretch and then bump your daytime temperatures back up to your normal day temperatures the rest of the day. And running that kind of cool morning pulse technique or a morning temperature dip technique uh, is a pretty economical way of limit, limiting stretch without using any labor. Um, but using these more advanced crop steering techniques is predicated on, again, having a good, properly sized and designed mechanical system uh, that can achieve these conditions in a very targeted way and responsive way. Um, it's, uh, we, we probably sound like a broken record always bringing up HVAC and airflow, but it really is such a important piece of the puzzle for success in these spaces. 
And what we often see is when a mechanical system is undersized or improperly installed in a multi-tier room, a lot of fans get added to the space as again, a band-aid to try and solve the problem. But unfortunately, fans don't solve the problem of an undersized HVAC or dehumidification capacity or improperly placed supply air and return air uh, grills. And Michael, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? It's, we talk about it all the time. We talk about it all the time. Um, <laughs> you know, I would say if you're a new operator, go visit facilities, um, go listen to their struggles. Um, the nice thing about working with someone like Pip is we have clients all over the world. And the way that Anders and I's mind work is we're always looking at root cause analysis. Um, we're looking at patterns that we see. We're answering a lot of the same questions. So uh, working with the right vendors, working with the right consultants will really help you streamline and, and just navigate away from some of this stuff. There's been a lot of lessons learned and you don't need to repeat those lessons. Um, before we transition into the harvest um, slide, I want to let you guys know there should be some way of uh, popping questions into the system. So if you have any questions and if you haven't already started, go ahead and start populating them in because we're going to get jump into Q&A in about two more slides. Um, but yeah, Anders, let's go ahead and uh, move on to some harvesting strategies. Sure. So harvesting is obviously a very exciting time in the uh, cultivation cultivators world, um, but it can also be very messy if not organized and thought through and having a plan for it. Um, it's a really a good practice to do a walkthrough of your flower room one to two days before uh, with whoever is managing that flower room and then whoever is managing that harvest to really set a, um, to set a plan moving forward over the next couple of days to streamline the harvesting. Um, one technique that a lot of people have found to be really useful in multi-tier to, to make harvest day a little bit more easy and the cleanup easier is sort of a, a dry down or a die on the vine strategy for the last 24 to 48 hours. Essentially what this is, is you dim your lights down, you're lowering your PPFD, signaling senescence, and you're also cutting back all irrigation events. And that's why it's a time range because some strains might need a little bit more water uh, than others, but you're cutting off irrigation events, you have low light levels, and you're leveraging the transpiration process to dry your plants, to get a jump start on the drying process uh, before you move them into a dry room. And this can really help for dry rooms that have undersized humidification capacity. Um, but some other added benefits of this kind of pre-dry technique um, by leveraging transpiration is there is physically less wet weight to move off the upper tiers and from the bottom tiers on harvest date. And so it's it's a really more efficient way of doing it. It's, it can mean the difference in a large flower room of a thousand total pounds that you have to move in a day, whether that is your substrate weight or the actual biomass itself. So I, I'm really an advocate for this. I've seen it really speed up a lot of harvest days uh, and just the labor, like the staff seems happier um, during that time. Um, you know, Michael, there's also some interesting ways to remove plants safely from the top tiers down to the floor. I mean, we see it all different types of ways, right? We see totes being used, um, scissor lifts. Uh, obviously, the totes are nice because you also have to record plant weights for compliance purposes at this time. That's a good way of doing it. Or just hanging whole plants, take the measurements. Um, what, what have you found to be your preferred method of moving plants down from the upper tiers? Like you said, it's it's all over the place. Um, yeah. It really depends on how much main aisle space you have and what kind of tools you can bring in there. But one of the things I wanted to mention is, it's why I like the Elevate platform so much. If you flank two Elevate platforms on the row that you're harvesting, um, you can harvest from both sides simultaneously. And some people have different preferences here. I like to work back to front and have two flanking people. Um, Oftentimes too, I'll, I'll get into an operation and I'll start observing and I'll notice that someone harvesting is faster than somebody else. Like there's always one person that is just outpacing everyone else. And, you know, I'll pull the manager aside and say, hey, what's, what is this person doing that's so different? Well, A, are they, are they jeopardizing quality by going too fast? You know, are they butchering product and they're just blowing through it? But if they're not, if they're actually going faster than the rest of the team and they're maintaining quality, 
that person should become like a trainer and they should be studied. You know, what are they doing that's so different? And then I would take that person and make them a trainer for the rest of the harvest team so that it's kind of all ships rise in the tide. It's great to have a fast trimmer or a fast harvester or a fast transplanter. But if it's just one person, the benefit of the whole team really isn't be, isn't taking advantage of that. And sometimes having one person that's faster than the rest of the team can actually throw everything out of sync. So, you know, when you identify these, you know, quote unquote rock stars, drill down on what they're doing that's different. And if it meets your quality control standards, encourage them to teach and train the rest of the people. Um, SOP should not be a dusty book on the shelf. Uh, mm -hmm. I like SOPs from like a Toyota mentality. They're a living, breathing entity and people should be incentivized to update SOPs that better help um, the organization as a whole. Um, yeah. You know, and whether you're harvesting whole plants or doing sort of a hook and hang type mentality, we're actually chopping down the plant on harvest day. Um, I really like using like a modular drying cart of some sort that you can wheel into the flower room, load up with a number of plants. I prefer that over totes because then the plants aren't getting damaged as much. And it's a lot more efficient to just wheel them into the dry room. And then what's nice about these drying carts too, is that you can either dry the plants directly on the carts or transition them to a mobile drying rack that you can see in the right hand side here where they're employing, you know, hangers and a uh, whole plant hang technique. Um, you know, it's also, Michael and I also talk about quite a bit with harvesting, uh, sizing the room for your facility layout and sizing your dry rooms so that you can harvest a whole room in a single day in a single shift. And that entire harvest will fit within a single dry room. Um, you know, and if Michael, you always say, right, that if you, if you can't fit a single harvest into a single dry room or do it within a single day, it's better to have two smaller dry rooms because then you don't have the issue of plants drying at different rates at different speeds, things like yeah, that, right? Re, re moistening events don't seem to do anything for quality. Yeah. Um, another important tip that I have, um, sometimes when I talk about same day uh, turnovers and room resets, people get really aggressive with the sanitation and cleaning process and they'll be doing it simultaneously as they're harvesting. And to me, that is a huge no-no. So it's really critically important to wait until the last plant has been removed from the room before you start cleaning and sanitizing. Um, handling and moving open top substrates like cocoa, as an example, can stir up a lot of particulate and fungi uh, and bacteria, which can contribute to high microbial testing on finished flour. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, this applies to all stages. Um, I like to do what's called uh, traditionally a spaghetti diagram. And that's where I basically take the drawings of whether it's a, a harvesting room, a flower room, it could be a trim, it could be any room. And I, and I basically map out various workflows. And the three workflows that I focus on are plants, people, uh, and waste. And I'll generally color code those in different colors. And you can do this also if you're in the pre-planning stages. So in the pre-planning stages, if you're like, oh, we have a great design, great. Let's work through these workflows. And what I'm looking for is linear workflow in the path of the plant. I'm looking for minimal um, extra steps. I'm looking for minimal opportunities of cross-contamination. Um, but you should do this with your existing operation because it's not uncommon in the world of labor for an operator to tell me, we don't have enough labor to do defoliation. We don't have enough labor for this. And uh, I think at some point that becomes an excuse because oftentimes what we find is if they just change up their approach and hold people a little bit more accountable, not only do they have enough labor, it's not uncommon for them to have too much labor and actually have to make a couple cuts. So mm -hmm. sometimes people will make this excuse, I don't have enough labor. And it's just a simple matter of they're not using their labor very efficiently. Um, you know, in summary, each plant stage, including harvesting and the strategies you deploy can either have a beneficial or non-beneficial impact on the quality of your final product. Tuning your mindset in to consider and evaluate not just what you do to plants, but why you do it and how does it positively or negatively impact the end user is the ultimate goal. So as we move to q and I just want everyone to always, it sounds a little silly, but if you put trichome preservation and end users at the forefront of everything you do, you will be more successful with a higher quality product. Um, and that being said, we're excited to shift over to Q&A. Uh, we're going to go a little bit over an hour today. Um, yeah. Any questions that we do not answer, um, we actually put a blog out. Um, we'll put it on our website. We'll email it to you. Um, and as you can see on the screen, you've got Anders and my personal contact information. 
Uh, Anders and I live and breathe this stuff every day, and we get the pleasure um, and honored to work with cultivators all over the world. So we get to see quite a bit under people's hoods and we leverage all this knowledge at PIP so that you can be the best operator in, in your state or country. Um, with that being said, um, Kelly, how are we doing the Q and A? We're doing fantastic. Uh, okay. as, as Michael mentioned, please do, uh, as we see the, the Q and A is, is filling up here. So why don't we just start off with some of the questions that have come in through the presentation? Okay. Sure. Anders, can you see those on your side? Yeah. Um, okay. One of the first questions is how do our, or how do PIPs mobile racking systems work with aeroponic systems? Um, they work great. Um, there's really, the, the only issue there is making sure you have the flexible plumbing to run, you know, irrigation lines to the mobile racking structures and making sure that the structures are designed to support the weight of your aeroponic system. So there's really no, uh, impediments there. It just takes some discussions with our team ahead of time to make sure that we have accounted for the weight and, you know, and we've designed around the irrigation lines being flexible. So some of those reservoirs can get big and heavy. That's really the biggest concern there. Um, Michael, here's one. What is the minimum height? What minimum height is needed for two tiered systems? And I wonder, this, there, yeah, this is, yeah, this is based on a lot of things. It's really grower confidence. Um, but typically most people are somewhere between a 12 and 14 foot rack, but we do have cultivators mm -hmm. that have a 10 foot rack and they're doing two tiers. The thing to be thinking about is what's the minimum height of the lowest impediment in my room. That could be HVAC, that could be sprinklering. You're still going to need a little bit of buffer up top. So um, if you have a 12 foot room, you're not going to have, I'm sorry, if you have a 10 foot room, you're not going to have a 10 foot rack. You'll probably have an eight foot rack. And there's a lot of creative things you can do in, in tighter spaces. Like instead of um, hanging the second tier lights off of the rack itself, you can actually hang them from the ceiling and go with a six foot tall rack as an example. So lots of creativity mm -hmm. in that space, Robin, and we'd be happy to talk to you about it uh, more uh, offline if you have a specific project and you want us to take a look at it. Yeah. We got one from Wally too. Um, appreciate the data-driven approach. Looking for point of clarification of what you're including in the yield metric. Can you define sellable product in your model? That is a great question, Wally. And there are a number of different ways to approach that. So when we we say sellable product, uh, typically what we refer to as UPM or usable plant material, that'll include A grade flower, B grade flower and then trim. But there's a lot of different ways you can kind of, you know, they say skin the cat with this one. Um, I'll give you an example of how I like doing it. Um, Michael, maybe you can give a little example how you like to do it as well. But basically, I like to report, like say to an investor class update uh, or to the rest of the owners or to the rest of my team, yield in a couple of different ways. One of them being an unadjusted grams per square foot yield. Uh, and I actually got this from, um, this is an example from a, a garden in Colorado. I really like a, a gentleman named Jerry Kieran. Uh, he's taught me a lot about the financials of indoor cultivation. And I really like the way he presents his yield um, at Clarity Gardens. And so what he does is he does an adjusted and unadjusted grams per square foot. Unadjusted would be including all A's and all B grade flower. And then he reports trim separately, I believe. And then his adjusted grams per square foot is he actually derates his B grade flower by 20 to 25% to reflect its true value in terms of what price you can sell that flower for to the market. And so he'll have his A grade flower being accounted for and his B grade flower in that grams per square foot reduced by 20% of the weight, just because you typically get less value out of B grade flower. And so he'll adjust, he'll show both metrics. Sorry if that was a little confusing. It's easier to see in my head, but I hope that makes sense. Did that make sense, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I mostly. I think it's a lot if someone's not it's, it's, familiar yeah. with that. But yeah. um, in most cases, I'm looking at usable plant material. We do a lot with fresh frozen, so it gets a little bit messy. Um, but depending on your where you're cultivating and what your market is demanding, whether that's trim flower or not, you can look at it a lot of different ways. Um, but typically usable plant material. Um, 
Now on the next one for, um, it's a, it's anonymous. It asking to, can we repeat the positive negative differential? What we'll do for that one, because it is a little bit complicated. Um, mm -hmm. we'll put a bunch of great content and writing together and we can send that out to you. Um, so, uh, anonymous, just keep, keep a lookout for that on our blog, but we'll get that sent out. Um, but essentially, you know, when you're using diffs, it's environmental crop steering. So you're manipulating the environment for different trait expression or, or plant cues. Um, all right. So Dan, we got you with, uh, when doing a retrofit or new build, are there incentive programs available to help out with startup cost? Ha, huh, not enough. Um, but you know, incentive programs are usually tied to rebates um, on the energy side. So things like lighting in most local municipalities will have a pretty significant rebate um, using energy efficient HVAC also is a really good area. Um, we have a mutual friend, uh, Gretchen, who talks a lot on podcasts, um, webinars, and uh, trade shows who specializes in this. Um, I know. I also Anders really recommend you reaching out to Resource Innovation Institute, a nonprofit um, founded by Derek Smith. Very great group as well, along with Gretchen. Um, they, they're helping kind of lead the charge on developing these indoor agriculture incentive programs throughout the country by working directly with governments and utilities along with you know, actual producers themselves to collect data to inform these programs. So PIP is a member of Resource Innovation Institute. Um, we're furthering helping that conversation and trying to make sure that these facilities being built are as efficient as possible and utilizing resources to the best way possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting field, uh, just trying to make these businesses as efficient and you know, sustainable. Yeah. And depending on if you own your building or you rent your building, that might be something that you can leverage in your negotiations with your landlord. Because uh, the reality is, is cannabis operators, if you're renting, you're putting an insane amount of TI or tenant improvements in the space. And that's something that can be negotiated a lot of times, um, or maybe deferring uh, rent for a while too. So there's lots of creativity if you're in a, a landlord uh, uh, kind of situation. All right, Mr. Brandon, uh, curious how PIP racking adds value and thinks about mounting brackets, conduit, et cetera, for HVAC lighting and feeding and et cetera. You know, when I got started years ago um, with Greenhouse, now a division of PIP horticulture, that was exactly what we were thinking about. It was like, how do we integrate all this stuff? Instead of mounting everything to ceilings and walls, well, why don't we just mount it to the racks? And so our racking system is... Um, extremely modular. It can be manipulated uh, to usually uh, within a couple inches in terms of tiers, but you can bolt on everything to it, including electrical, plumbing, irrigation, um, lighting. That's all. We've put a lot of energy and a lot of time to make sure that all of that stuff integrates relatively seamlessly from an operator standpoint. Uh, we work with lots of different lighting vendors. We know what other lighting configurations look like. We made sure that um, we had uh, adaptive tools uh, integrated into our system that allowed for all the various types of lighting and all the other various components as well. So, um, you know, PIP is a, is like a blank canvas that you can easily attach things to. That's a good way of putting it. Um, Moses, have you noticed with the pre-drying strategy, does it affect the overall product, THC, terps, et cetera? And it does. And I will let Anders uh, highlight that a bit further. <laughs> Yeah, it affects it in a positive way, in my experience. Um, if anything, that added stress during those last few days of senescence and ripening uh, really help, if anything, bring out a higher THC content and bring out a little bit more terp production at the end, really as just a, as a further stress. So um, yeah, it does affect, but in a positive way, in my experience. Um, okay. I really like that strategy. Um, I wanted to answer Marcus's real quick. If I'm sorry, if I'm jumping ahead, but you know, Marcus, I apologize if there weren't any images of the Elevate scaffolding system in there. I might have misspoke on that. But if you go to pipporticulture.com right here on this um, slide, there's a whole page all about the Elevate rack, uh, platform system and with a lot of good information there. And if you have more questions about it, feel free to reach out to us and we can point you in the right direction. But uh, our, our team, Dell and Tom and, and the engineering staff worked really hard, um, went through hundreds of configuration, trying to figure out the best, most efficient way to install and work with these scaffolding systems. And I think what they came up with was really ingenious. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with that, that system. Okay. 
what else we got here, Mike? I, I, I've lost my screen there. I can't see it. You'll have to read them. Okay. Um, this, Moses has another good question. What is the most efficient way of resetting multi-tier racking, starting with top and work down? Question mark. Thoughts? I like to start on the bottom because sometimes when you're working on top, there's things that can become messy that can float to the bottom, but things don't generally float to the top. Mm -hmm. like sub substrate part particulate or plant material or things of that nature. So I typically do start on the first tier when it comes to harvesting and resetting. And I usually yeah. go back to front. Yeah, me too. I like to do a back corner where the door is located to the front. It's the easiest. Um, we got another one here from someone who's anonymous. Uh, are you working to design vertical racking systems, which could be used inside greenhouses with dirt flooring? Um, good question. It's a good uh, question. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, I was going to say we have actually quite a few installations in greenhouses, particularly in the veg, uh, but they usually have concrete floors. So yeah. the dirt flooring does throw it off a little bit. When it comes to dirt, um, it's obviously really hard to roll something over it. So in dirt, we typically see fixed leg with rolling bench tops. And uh, one of our divisions, uh, GGS, um, they have a lot of single tier options there. Um, it's a good question. I have to think on it some more, but right now we're not actively doing that. You'd be the first customer that's requested it. So hopefully <laughs> we can maybe get some more and then we can put a little energy that way, but that would be quite challenging um, as I think about it at a high level, just off the cusp. Yeah. Yeah. The, with mobile vertical racking systems, the floor, the quality of the floor and how level the floor is really does, uh, is quite important for the installation of these systems. So they need to be very level and they need to be as smooth as possible to basically apply a, a tracking system. We have track and track free systems for our racking, but the even the track free still requires at least one guide rack um, for to basically prevent the racks from getting off kilter. And so, yeah, dirt would be pretty tough, I think, to install tracks in uh, and keep it level enough so that you wouldn't have some kind of wonky performance with the, the mobile portion of these racking systems. Um, okay. I think that's- Got time for a couple, one more, two more? Yeah, let's see here. Um, Alex has a question. How are, growers, how are growers processing product after whole plant hang? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I've got, I've got a quick one there, Anders, for yeah, you. Um, for it. it depends on what you're doing with this plant, but one of the things that we've been encouraging people to do and the ones that are doing it are really happy with it is if you plan for a little bit more um, width in your main aisle in front of your drying rack and also make sure that your mobile aisle in your drying rack has a decent amount of working space, we're seeing that instead of people historically were basically taking plants off the drying rack, putting them in a tote, putting them on a cart, wheeling them to another processing room, taking them down, then bucking them usually by hand, or maybe they're using an automated bucking machine. Um, that's a lot of touch points. What we like to do is basically bucket in the drying room. So you open up the mobile aisle, right where you're taking it there and you're bucking it potentially by hand, or you could have machines on the front of the main aisle um, and you're bucking inside that room because that room is already technically dirty and messy. And so it doesn't make sense to go dirty or messy up another room when you can do all that at once and then clean one room and not have to take those additional unnecessary steps um, or potentially do multiple tote transfers, which degrades trichomes like we talked about earlier. So um, I do see that being quite popular with operators. Um, Anders, do you have any other anecdotes on that note? Um, just around the trellising, there's a lot like we, we talk about it, Michael, about do you, do you cut the trellis off in the flower room or do you wait to do it another time? I think there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, but one strategy I like is, you know, as you're harvesting plants, cutting them at the base, leaving the trellis internal to the canopy and a whole plant hang there until the plants are mostly dry and then cutting it out um, in the dry room at the end of the day. It's just a little bit faster. There's a lot of stuff to do on harvest day. And so that's just one less step you have to do. And I found it to be somewhat a little easier to do once the plants are dry, but you still have to be careful to not knock those trichomes out. 
I also see people um, using like um, painters um, paper and like a roll of paper. You get at like a Home Depot or a Lowe's mm -hmm. um, or the equivalent hardware store in your country. And they'll roll that on the floor because they're going to be making a mess. There's a lot of plant material. It gets stepped on. You get chlorophyll broken up. It goes into your, maybe your newly cleaned epoxy floor. So let's just take a quick minute before they do the process. They'll roll out usually brown, you know, certain width uh, roll of paper, put some blue tape down uh, of whatever the common path of travel is. And that way it preserves the floors a little bit better and makes for a little bit easier cleanup. Yeah. All right, let's do one last question and we'll get people on with their day. And then we'll respond, like I said, with a lot more detail to these questions over the next week or two. Yeah, um, let's see here. Uh, you speak of staff responsibilities. Do you have a sample of duties that include appropriate SOPs? That's from Robin. Um, <sighs> it's a tough one. Um, it's a tough one to answer. Uh, the answer is yeah. yes, but and it's a, a challenging one to communicate. But yeah, I mean, every role at your cultivation facility should have a very clear job description um, and then also associated responsibilities. And one of the things that we like to do to eliminate uh, the I didn't know any better or I didn't understand what I was doing is we do what we call uh, uh, task specific one sheets. So it's like a living visual SOP that's on the wall and it's right in front of the task. So if it's in propagation, you would basically use pictures and small descriptions to highlight every step of propagation. Um, and you should also um, highlight, here's what an ideal clone looks like. And that way there really aren't a lot of excuses of, I didn't know what I was doing or you know why I deviated off a task that was established as a best practice by the company. Um, and one of my favorite visual aids of all time is uh, what I call the home position or the resting position. So, yeah. um, or sometimes returning it to zero. So let's say you have a trim room and you have all this stuff everywhere. Well, you basically have a picture of when you finally sanitize and clean and put everything back in its home, what it looks like. And so when it's time to actually do that every day, you can look at that picture and you can reference and say, oh, the trim machine actually goes to this corner. Oh, the scissors go up here on this magnetic strip. And you can use it as a reference tool. And it just starts to eliminate some of the excuses that come up in operations on why someone didn't do a task the way that the company had asked them to do that task. Because training and SOPs are get forgotten if they're not constantly upkept. So, you know, lots of strong visual aids uh, that are specific to certain areas and tasks will go a long way and they don't cost you a lot of money to produce. And I personally believe it's a very good exercise to not purchase SOPs, but also try and create your own as best you can. Whether working with a consulting firm who has a sort of templatized SOP stack, regardless, those SOPs need to be tailored to your facility specifically. Uh, it's almost impossible to write a universal SOP stack for every cultivation facility out there. They, are, they tend to be quite specific with detailed information and that's why it's really hard to say, oh, here's the here's a an SOP for exactly how you run every kind of staff responsibility across yeah. the board. So, and it's a living, breathing document too. And those yeah. kind of prefab S SOPs, those are great for an application because they mm -hmm. talk kind of generally about things. But when it comes time to operate, I find that I use SOPs a lot less, and I focus on these work instructions and these yeah. visual aids. Um, and we encourage people to find more efficient ways to do things and bring those to our attention. And if that ends up um, passing the test for us, we'll update the SOPs. And like I said earlier, I try and reward people that are trying to help us be as efficient as possible, incentivizing people to take SOP seriously and, and giving them and empowering them, giving them the opportunity to say, you have a chance to make these SOPs better. I'm interested in hearing your ideas. Um, nobody knows better on how to do something more efficiently than the people on the ground floor, typically. You know, one other thing too that I've seen on a few facilities more and more recently um, is hosting your SOPs digitally in some sort of cloud or platform type service. Uh, what I really liked about that is it makes it easy to update constantly. It allows your staff to uh, provide comments to these, you know, these digital SOP documents, which allow like right there and comment within the platform. And it allows you to add videos for certain very specific processes. Like I've always had trouble describing exactly how to clone on written word, but creating a short video and hosting it on this SOP website or training website made it a lot easier to communicate where to take clones, what size, and certain more complicated steps throughout the cultivation process. So 
there's a lot of different platforms out there. Um, yeah, it's but, something worth looking into. No, thank you for saying that. I forgot to mention on the on the process specific one sheets, we'll put a QR code on there. You can scan oh, the QR code; cool. it'll go right to the video. Um, so that's it's cool. visual pictures, but then if you want to go in depth a little further, scan the QR code. And this is just saving your manager's time because when someone's off task, what do they do? They go interrupt someone who's on task and ask what to do. And then that person usually doesn't know. Then you got two people off task. Now you see that a group of 10 people see that two people aren't working. They start to get off task. They go get a manager. I mean, it becomes this domino effect. So give people the tools ahead of time to empower them to do the best job possible. And it'll really help streamline production and just communications in general. Mm -hmm. With that all said, we want to thank you guys so much for spending this much time with us. Um, we really appreciate the questions and we look forward to uh, our next webinar. And I uh, hope yeah. you guys all have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you all for joining. I hope we found it useful and, and kind of educational. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here for you as a resource at Pitt Horticulture. Oh, wonderful. With that final question coming through, that does bring our webinar today to a close. Thank you to Michael and Andrews for sharing your expertise with us today. If we didn't have a chance to get to your question or if you think of something, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out directly to today's presenters, whose contact information will be sent out with a link to the recording shortly. A big thank you to you, the audience, for making time to view this presentation. And until next time. Bye. Cheers.